Now, as you journey alone, this is the only way to know something. When you journey, when you experience, you have to dive within the inner sanctum. By standing on the shore of the ocean, you cannot know the depth. You cannot know the ocean by standing on the shore. You are moving amidst the waves. You are, and what are the waves? There are emotional waves, intellectual waves. All these are waves. And as long as you are in the waves, you cannot know. These are not the ways of happiness. And the ways of happiness, the ways of bliss, the ways of knowing is to enter the ocean. Waves are many, the ocean is one. Maybe there are 18,000 neighbor regions, maybe. But the ultimate energy field is one. One alone is hidden within many. And the secret of entire life is encased in this sutra. Seek this cosmic oneness. Hold on to the thread hidden amidst the beads of all the sutras. This one is very significant message of Nanda. It is said, Buddha told his monks, whenever you pass by anyone, See his well-wisher, be his well-wisher. Even if it be the plant, even if it be, be anything else, that does not matter. If you are passing by the tree, wish the tree a pleasant day. If you are meeting a person, seek his welfare, wish him the inner bliss. Moms said what will happen with that. Buddha said with that, no ill thought will come to you and your energy field will create something within that person. This is the way to hold on to the thread hidden amidst the beads. I have heard once something strange happened in a scientific laboratory. In that place, all kinds of poisons were available. Suddenly, of these poisons, the study of these poisons was the objective of that lab. Then suddenly the place got infected with rats. Several efforts were made to get rid of these rats. However, each effort proved futile. The rats were immune to any poison that was used on them. The problem continued as rats consumed all the poison that was used to kill rats as food. Then someone suggested adopting the usual old device, rat. Trap. This did not work because rats were not attracted to food inside. Rats got so accustomed to the poison that nothing else attracted them. This brought forward another device. Someone suggested applying a layer of poison on a piece of bread. Maybe this will work. This proved useful. The poison layer on the bread attracted the rat. They came in and got trapped. This story seems strange, but this is not a story. It actually happened. Your condition is similar like that of the rats. You are accustomed to words that even if you have to be explained, silence, it has to be done through the words. Even if food has to be given, it has to be wrapped in poison. And to explain the glory of silence, words have to be used. 
Even if the infinite has to be indicated, the finite has to be used to take you to infinite zero or ultimate emptiness again words have to be used so to to explain the ocean drop has to be used explanation of drop does not point towards the ocean there is no correlation between the two so to there can be no relation between your finite understanding and the vast ocean human intelligence is limited and the sky is infinite and is spread like a vast canoe no finite intellect or world can encompass the vastness of the blue sky or the depth of the neither regions the mystical neither regions or water capital below the earth surface however this is what has to be used you have become so accustomed to words that you cannot go beyond their finiteness truth is not far away problem is in words truth is even closer than your heart and its beat on your own breath to you you are lost in the web of habits and because of these habits you cannot know that which is these habits comprise your mind and your conditions therefore the entire effort of the master is to give you the taste of the new mind so the mind now as the mind disappears you are not at the shore instead you have now entered the ocean this is why it is important when we have live meditation sessions or congregation we use meditation and thereafter the explanation says but in these meditation sessions which are not live in a way but they are live in another way the words are used to create the silence the music the gaps between the words the choice of the words their arrangements their rhythm all that is used to create the silence there is no other way to know the ocean instead by entering it all talks about the ocean standing on the shore are useless when who has known the ocean can no longer remain on the shore when who has tasted the unknown nothing can stop him the attraction of the unknown is tremendous there can be no greater magnetic force than this sitting within your four walls you are talking about the infinite open sky in close to within your cages you are speaking of freedom and and close to within your words and finiteness you are speaking of the formless and like in a way it helps it gives you the first attraction and these talks are to create and in sociable question you to know to explore that which is try to understand the essence of this you cannot understand these by standing at the shore only when you drown in the being or the energy field of the master then you will understand the essence not only that you will begin to overflow the free prince that nanak is nanak says there are infinite neither rain neither regions all around there is a sky spread like a vast blue infinite canopy when the sky extends to become infinite when a luminous infinite when the sky extends to become infinite 
Did you understand when you look at the sky? The sky is one, but one has become infinite because it is spread like a vast canopy. One sky alone extends to become infinite. One alone is infinite. Nanak says all around is a sky alone. There is not one infinite sky. The sky is infinite, infinite. Wherever you will go on the infinite sky, you will find a spread like a canopy. Whatever you touch is infinite. All around infiniteness exists. And this infiniteness surrounds you. When you say the, the sky surrounds you, what does the sky represent? Does it represent heaven and earth? No. The sky represents infiniteness. Its nature is infinite, unborn. And it is the unborn, infinite that surrounds you every moment. Amidst this infinite, you are trying to capture God in finite cages of the worlds. Also, you are trying to encage this infinite vastness in books. It is as if you want to keep the sky in your fist. And significantly enough, the open fist is in the sky. And as you close the fist, the sky lies outside. So use the words like open fist. Never use the words like closed fist. All closed fisted words are logical. The words you choose, how you arrange them, they should be like an open fist. These have limitations, that which is like a closed fist. All closed fisted words are logical. These are limitations. The more something is closed, more definitions are needed. And whenever something is defined, it becomes limited. A wall is erected. The more the words will be full of logic, it will be incapable to give taste of the unknown. And when the words are open-fisted, they are like musical notes, beyond all limitations in logic. Try to understand this difference. The words of Nanak are not the words of a logician. Certainly these are the words of a poet. These are the words of a singer. These are the words of someone who loves beauty. Through these words, Nanak is not giving any definition. When words are like open fist, these words are not saying anything. Instead, words are not saying anything. They are indicating towards something that cannot be put into the words. Often, open-fisted words mean that Something is being indicated which cannot be put into the words. Do not hold on to the words, otherwise you will miss the message. It is like my finger that is pointing towards the moon. And you hold on to the finger thinking it to be the moon. My finger is only pointing towards the moon. The finger is meaningless. And what is really meaningful is the direction. And the moon, leave the finger, the finite, get hold on to the infinite. That is why music is very significant. It uses the words, it uses the notes, it uses the intonation and all that encompasses music to connect you to the infinite, to connect you to the wordless. Man starts worshipping books. Someone worships Veda while the others worship a Quran, a Bible, a Guru Granth Sahib and thus begins the process of worship of the finite. 
Once again, word becomes meaningful. However, word is meaningless. That which can only be understood through the wordless. That which is can only be understood through the wordless. If the words do not create this silence, if the gaps between the words, the modulation of the words does not connect you to your inner silence, the talks are meaningless. If the talks, the choice of the words, the gaps, the modulation does not connect you to your innerness, take you to that space between mind and meditation, it is meaningless. The purpose of the master, the purpose of the talks is to take you to that space which lies between mind and meditation so that you get a taste of something and that can create an insatiable question you to search that which is beyond the mind and yet can be encompassed within the energy field of meditation beyond. Your attention is towards that space which lies beyond the mind, which lies beyond the world. All the masters and the scriptures say, intellect cannot search that which is through intellect you will be lost. All the scriptures narrate the story of man's helplessness. All religions agree on one thing that no human doing is really capable of giving the glimpse of the unknown and unknowable, the path of journey of God, path of journey of innerness is different. There you have to drop all efforts, your thinking, logics, and your ways and means. All these create obstruction. Your intellect cannot become the ladder to success. Ladder of success. Your intellect stands like a china wall. The more you trust your intellect, you will find your journey will be difficult. It is the intelligence which is more important, not the intellect. An intelligence is that capacity to discern that which cannot be known. You have to leave everything in his hands. Trusting the intellect implies you still have trust in your own efforts. Have you ever thought that which you can search can never be greater than you? That which you aim to achieve will definitely be smaller than you. Therefore, even if you have attained somehow God, that can no longer remain God. Then how can one reach or attain to that which is? The path is just opposite. Only one who is ready to lose himself can attain. Kabir says, Sish diye, one who is ready to give his head, can verily attain. What does it mean by head? Head means all your conditionings, all that you claim that you have known, all that you consider your intellect, your knowledge, that has to be given. When Bodhidharma sat facing the wall for nine years, and thereafter the man named Huawei came and he stood behind Bodhidharma and insisted on him to turn his head towards him. Bodhidharma said that it is better to face a wall than a man because man is like a wall. You cannot penetrate through the wall the more you try to do. Have you ever tried to penetrate through the wall? Try one day. And when I say, you will say what the stupidity is that. You can understand that it is, the wall is impenetrable and you cannot penetrate through the wall. It is solid. So is your mind. Your mind is impenetrable. 
we cannot penetrate it. There are people who are coming for so many years, but not even a single peephole has been able to make it into the home that their mind is. They come, they appreciate, go back, the same approach continues. Bodhidharma refused. He said, I will, Kuenin said, I am ready to cut off my head, cut off my hands. Bodhidharma replied, that will not matter. Cutting off hands means what? Symbolically it means you are ready to use your hands, your efforts in so-called social works, so-called charities, in the service of God. It is said service is one of the greatest effort to attain to that, which is Bodhidharma refuted that. Then nothing happened when he remained standing. Then he said, I am ready to cut off my head, even, all that I have. Bodhidharma immediately turned his head to him, looked at him. And he said, if you are ready to cut off your head, then something can happen. Bodhidharma said it in that way. Kabir said it in his own way. Everyone says the same truth in different ways and means. How can one reach or attain God? The path is just opposite. Only one who is ready to lose himself can attain. He is to be in harmony with him. Buddha says, whosoever you meet, seek for his welfare, pray for his welfare. And by seeking his welfare or being, praying for his welfare means what? Being in harmony. When I say be in harmony with all that is, all that is happening, any circumstance and situation that you face in a particular moment, be in harmony with that. It is praying for that. Even if you meet your enemy, do not turn your face. Wish him. Wish for his welfare. Wish for his understanding. And then move forward. Even if you encounter a tree, or a mountain, or something else, when you pass by it, seek its welfare, pray for its welfare, be in harmony with it, various ways and means of saying the same thing. I can say the same thing in different ways and means. The ways to accept all that is happening, the ways to be in total harmony with all that is you cannot encompass the infinite in your final peace. That is why Nanak feels like sacrificing is everything for him. Still it will be less. All this means you remove your mind, your effort, and never impose your will. You start flowing towards him. This is why trust is valuable and logic is futile. Trust means you cannot decide, only he is the judge. And Jesus says, cautions you, judging not that he not be judged, but we go on judging him without any effort, as if this is the only way that we have. Nanak says that there are infinite skies and infinite neither regions. This is what Veda declares. The word Veda is beautiful. It comes from the Sanskrit root. That means root with bit means to know. Veda does not mean the four books, the important books, the scriptures of Hindus. Veda implies that which is known. Knowing is a different way. Veda Vedas are the words of those who have known. It is the message of the masters, the learned ones. It comes from Sanskrit root, 
inclined to do. It has nothing to do with the four books. Anyone who has known truth has become a Veda. Veda has no limitations because Veda is knowing. Knowing has no limitations. It means essential knowing. All Veda leaders declare that in your own effort you will get by. Try to understand this. In the life of an aspirant, all efforts simply have to exhaust first. This is meaningful. You are trying to remember something, trying to remember a word, the name of the person, phone number of a person. The more you focus, the more you try, the more you find it is becoming difficult. The more you try to make an effort, the more you exert your mind, your memory, all becomes futile. Then all of a sudden, you get so frustrated. It is a better word to use at this moment that you leave it. You start doing something else. Maybe washing the vehicle, watering the plants, taking a bath, reading a newspaper, watching a news channel. All of a sudden something springs forth and the name of that person comes in. The two things are important. You have to exhaust your efforts. You have seen a coin. You have to tighten it. Let it go to its limit. And the moment you release it, it uncoils itself. So when your memory is tightened through your efforts to its limit, it uncoils. Until all your efforts exhaust, you will not be ready for a new journey. You will continue to hold on to your ego. Along the journey, a stage will come when all your efforts will prove futile. You will realize that none of your efforts can take you forward until your dual sense remains nothing is possible. Nothing can happen. The day your efforts prove futile, ego will dissolve as a natural process and then the journey will begin. Nafs Kushi is considered to be one of the criteria for inward journey to begin. It is the criteria to enter the realm of Kalp. There is an important incident in the life of Buddha. Buddha continued this search for six years. His search was not an ordinary one. Instead, it was so intense that probably no other person would have made such ardent efforts. He did all that was told to him to do. Sometimes you are told to do the impossible because it is felt that this person is nagging too much. Tell him something which seems to be impossible and he may leave you. But Buddha was not Buddha's search. Buddha's quest was not such. He did all that was told to him to do. No one could say that Buddha had not attained because his efforts were not total. His efforts were so intense that no master could complain. Then most of them said they do not know anything more than this. And if they happened to attain to that which is, he should come and tell them. He should come and tell them and let them know. Buddha even lived on a grain of rice for six months. Imagine how frail he would have become. He was a prince born into a princely clan. His body was beautiful, full of courage, but he lived on one grain of rice for six months. He became very frail. He could not stand upon his own. Such was his efforts. Yet still he could not attain. 
The problem was not that his efforts were not intense. The problem was that the doer is put it remained that I am doing this. Instead it should be that the doer sense is not there. I have been asked to do this. All his efforts, fasting, yoga and austerities simply made his ego more subtle. In doing all this, Buddha became very weak and frail. All his efforts proved futile. He did everything that was humanly possible. Yet still nothing happened. He went to the river Niranjana for a bath. He was so weak that he could not come out. Instead he fell in the river. River Niranjana is a stony river, very shallow. One can walk. If one is a study and know how to walk through the stony river. And as he started to flow with the stream, he held on to the branch of the tree leaning from the other shore of the river. That very moment, that very moment I thought into him that all his efforts proved futile. He has exhausted all his energy in doing all that was told to him and nothing happened. Because of weakness, he could not even cross the shallow stony river. And how can he cross the ocean of life? Thought came to his mind. The palace and all palatial comforts was lost. Wealth became meaningless too. That very moment, with inner tiredness, even a spiritual search became meaningless. A thought arose. There is nothing worth attaining in life, nothing in moksha. Because the search for moksha liberation is also a desire. Somehow he came out of the river, cleaned under the Bodhi tree, prepared a bed of leaves, and sat under the Bodhi tree. All efforts were lost. Frustration was total that very moment there was no hope. There was nothing to gain. Buddha relaxed. Under the tree he fell asleep. Frustration and tiredness implies all hopes vanished. Dreams are no more. Buddha slept. No desire, no dream, nothing to gain. That night, there was no thought. He had entered the space beyond mind between mind and meditation. All thoughts are the outcome of desire. Thoughts follow desire like a shadow. The dawn was near. The last star was about to disappear. Buddha opened his eyes. There was nothing to be done. And that very moment, Buddha became enlightened. That very moment, Buddha became Gautam Siddhartha, became Buddha the Enlightened. This happened. This is what Nanak is talking about. Tiredness of efforts reached its culmination. Ego dissolved. All efforts proved futile. Blessings showered as an offering, as your all hopes vanish. Your search comes to an end. Your fist is now open. No effort is needed to open the fist. All efforts are needed to keep the fist closed. The moment efforts are no more, fist is open. And when you are not doing anything, the fist cannot remain closed. It will open on its own. In the morning, Buddha opened. Buddha's fist opened on its own. Kabir says, all that is meaningless happens when your efforts prove futile and you are in a state of non-doing, a state of non-doing. Nanak rem reminds this is what all the scriptures, Vedas say to you, that you may get tired, but you will not reach the beginning and end of the Creator. And the moment you reach the culmination of your efforts, 
beyond which no more effort is possible you can attain that this very moment only when you are tired of your efforts that very moment goes of the unknown opens to you remember there are three layers of energy the physical layer of energy that comes with food that you eat and all as you interact in the world of objects and things then there is a next layer of energy the emotional layer which is subtle and more intense the third layer is the infinite layer of energy i only give you three layers the third layer is infinite layer of energy and they, these are all have their own doors when you reach the threshold the peak all the physical energy is exhausted when you have reached to the very end then all of a sudden the door of emotional layer of the energy opens it is like palace which has magical doors or door senses as we have in the modern day technology you are outside but until you reach a certain closeness to that door the sensor will not be able to pick you the moment sensor picks you up without any effort the door opens but you have to come closer to that this in a spiritual terms refers to the stage when your efforts self reach their culmination you have been walking all the way from the car park to the door to enter the airport now you have reached to that point you have waded through the sun and the rain the cold is these are your efforts and the moment your walking has come to an end because you have reached to the very threshold and as the sensor picks you up you do not have to make any effort the door automatically opens so to when your physical energy reaches its culmination your effort automatically the emotional layer emotional energy begins becomes available to you and then you continue now you have entered the airport you are again walking another layer another realm and the journey continues and again when you refer reaches its culmination and when you reach to the very threshold and the door opens and that door is of infinite energy this can be understood through an example you return home from the day's work tired you tell your wife to make a cup of tea because you are tired and you tell her that you are going to take a rest you are resting you are instructed not to wake you up for the food dinner if you wake up on your own that's fine if not do not disturb all of a sudden your phone which is by your bedside rings and you get a news that comes like a disaster you were not expecting or maybe in some distant regions of your mind you were expecting that comes to you or you find that your house is on fire suddenly you will end the door for the next layer of the energy will open and you will enter into the second layer of your energy that is the emotional energy one can practice for that and the simple technique of that is you start jogging where physical energy is needed everyone has a limit that they can based on their physical energy that they can jog for a certain period of time after that breath becomes shorter and shorter and you get tired and you cannot continue this is the moment when all the physical energy that you have 
as exhausted. Those who are fat, they will get tired faster as compared to those who continuously focus on their eating, they are eating healthy, their threshold, the limit is extended by the style of their life. Resistance becomes more. But if at that time you continue to jog again, let's say they have first instance you can jog for 10 minutes. When your instructor says continue to jog, you say I cannot jog anymore. I may fall down in a moment. I am so tired. But he says no, you will not fall, but you have to continue. You are being persuaded to enter into the second layer of energy. And if you continue, you will realize that after a few seconds, the door of the second layer of energy opens and you can continue to jog for the next 10 minutes. Maybe at that moment, a momentary pause is necessary. You connect to your inner self, connect to your hara, your solar plexus, again you start and you can continue for another 10 minutes. Again, you reach to the point where this energy that was contained that you have been able to muster for that layer is reaching to its pinnacle, is coming to exhaust. Again the same thing and the third layer will open. Now through this exercise you can learn to change your gear when it is needed. Those who have a liking of cricket, yesterday in T20, the game was played between Australia and India. One of the players, it was as if that at his own will he was changing the game. First, ten balls, then the next, then the next, and he came in the top gear. In the vehicle you change the gear. When a certain amount of speed is attained, you change the gear. You know because the mechanism of the vehicle is such that you can change the gear on its on your own will. When you see the road is ready, you can change the gear. When this particular player saw that the required run rate was so much and he started targeting the particular bowler, he changes gear. In the same way through this particular effort, we learn the art of changing the gear, going into the top gear. This is one of the methods to enter into those realms. This is the reason that all paths and systems aim at exhausting your efforts. You cannot attain through yoga or any other system. Each system simply exhausts your effort and your ego. Until one exhausts all energy in search, journey does not complete. That is why masters say that you can attain only by the divine grace. You attain only through the grace, not through the effort. If you think your efforts are enough, then all that you get cannot be bigger than you.